Take a breath, step outside. Yat A, as we say back home, Yat O, throwing a little dialect and vernacular there. Thank you all for being with us this evening. Indigenous Ways always likes to acknowledge the traditional owners and country throughout Turtle Island and loves to pay respect to our elders as well as our present and past future carriers of the stories. We want to take this time to acknowledge traditional owners and ancestors of these lands we reside on in Santa Fe, New Mexico, the Pueblo people, and wherever, wherever you're beaming in from, we'd like to acknowledge your traditional owners, ancestors, and caretakers of the land that's going to leave a really nice, gentle footprint for the future generations, the unborns. Indigenous Ways is dedicated to bridging cultural exchange with people globally. Our goal is to all walk together, nobody in front, nobody behind, nobody above, nobody below. We are all equal, five-fingered people. We all bleed red blood, the same as the salt water of Mother Earth, which we are a part of. Indigenous Ways started in August 2020, I mean, April 2020 of last year, excuse me, so we could stay connected. And this has actually turned into an amazing platform to uh, have people come and support people all over the globe that want some kind of indigenous connection if they belong to the indigenous LGBTQIA, um, deaf, hard of hearing, uh, different sectors of the Caucasian people, all kinds of indigenous people, people all over the world globally are able to come in. So we have our Wednesday evening wisdom circles at six o'clock. Once a month, the third Saturday, we have our concert series, which we're going to have this Saturday. We're excited about that. So thank you all. Your time is very precious. And thank you for choosing Indigenous uh, Ways to be a part of this evening with our beautiful guest speaker, Taz Tamu Povi. And there's al also another name in there, Taz, which um, I can't remember. Elena was telling me your other name. I was like, God, that's the coolest name I've ever heard in my life. So everybody, Taz hails from the San Ildefonso Pueblo. And she is definitely a beautiful caretaker of the land, of her people, of her beautiful daughter herself. And let's go ahead and get this evening started. Hey, Taz, how's it going? Hey, Taj, thanks for having me. Um, the first name is Sandora. That's the first name that my- That's it. Yeah, Sandora, but I go by my middle name, which is Taz. Awesome. <laughs> All right, Taz. So, uh, Taz, before we get started with our questions, can you tell us a little bit about your background and some context of your childhood and upbringing and stuff? Yeah. Um, so my mom um, was Tewa and um, French Caribbean from Trinidad. And um, I spent my childhood until I was 12 back and forth in California and on the reservation here in San Alfonso Pueblo. Um, my dad is African American and um, my mom and him divorced when I was 13 um, because it was a, a rough relationship. Um, so I didn't know a lot of my dad's family or even a lot of my dad's history. Um, mm. He had a lot of abuse in his life growing up. And so therefore it kind of, you know how it does, it rolls over yes. to the next generation. Um, but I've lived here on the Pueblo for most of my life. I moved when I was a young adult to Denver for a few years. Um, and then I came back here to have my daughter, to have my daughter. And I've been here since, so 14 years now. Wow, that is so awesome. Mm -hmm. I'm so grateful that you came back because we get to know you. So it's such a privilege and an opportunity for us to uh, be able to be connected, even though we're not attached in a physical sense where we get to see each other every day. But in the heart, I believe we've established a really special connection with you and your beautiful daughter and your gorgeous Pueblo, which is the people that brought Elena in from Australia and New Zealand. So thank yeah. you very much, Taz. It's good. It was good for me to move away and come back because then I was really able to see, be way more grateful and see all the beauty all around me, you know, and all the gifts of having a community, 
the gifts of the sunsets, the stars, the skies here, so, so precious. Did you uh, find yourself missing California? I was in California when I was really little. Um, we went there a lot because I still have family there. Um, it's too fast for me. It's too, too loud and too fast for me. You know, Colorado, when I was in my 20s, Denver, Colorado was enough. And then even that got to be too loud. And when I came home, just to appreciate, like, to hear the animals, the birds, the coyotes, like, to have the dark sky and see all the stars, I missed it. I, I But I had taken it for granted. So it was good to move away and come back and be like, wow, like, how blessed am I to to look out my door and see the Black Mesa, you know, and the snow falling and bald eagles. And yeah, it's gorgeous. Wow. I can imagine if a person has been in a city around a lot of concrete and tall buildings, and then all of a sudden they do this geographic and come to see all this landscape and earth and bright stars at nighttime, I imagine it would probably be hard to really see that for at, at least at, in the moment to really feel it like it might take a moment for it to all process that wow I'm here yeah or when you grow up here right you grow up here and you just kind of take it for granted that it's so gorgeous you don't realize like you see coyotes you know we can look out our back door sometimes and see the coyotes running you know the other day I told my daughter watch come out look there's a bald eagle flying over us wow. I mean you take those things there's things for granted, right? To drive by the river every day to the sunsets we have here. And and then when you go somewhere else, you're like, oh, that's not what everyone has. Like you come back to it and there's a different kind of appreciation, you wow. know? And then one thing that just came to my mind when you said you saw a bald eagle, when I see a bald eagle, I wanna pull off, get out of the car, cry and pray in gratitude. Yep. But I hear other people say, oh, they're vultures. And I'm like, okay, different perspectives, different strokes for different folks, eh? I'm always happy to see them. I'm always happy to see them flying around. I'm always happy that they have survived, that they survived their genocide, right? And that now they're, they're um, flourishing and there's so many of them. I'm, I'm grateful for that. That is so awesome. So you were talking about your father having some uh, abuse in his background issues and stuff like that. And I always think of you as a person that has some real healing medicine, because when I see you, I always receive some kind of medicine. If it's just from your essence or you bring us some tea that you've pulled from your lands and you share with us or something, there's just always this healing element or component that comes with you. Can you talk to me about what your healing journey looks like and how did it start and why did it start? Yeah, um, thank you. Thank you for that. Um, my mom, like my mom was, um, so my mom was in an abusive relationship with my father. And when she left him, I watched her um, do the work on herself. I watched her um, talk about what she had experienced. Um, she brought in healers for us, therapists um, to talk with us when we were younger. Wow. She talked about um, the struggles she had around um, um, addiction. Well, I don't know if she never called it addiction, but the struggles she had around um, drinking um, in, a, in a way that was out of control. Um, she talked about um, her father and his addiction and what she had grown up with and that there was never space. Nobody ever talked about it. She just grew up, mm. she moved away and nobody ever talked about her my grandparents' relationship and the abuse that was there, the addiction that was there. And she recognized that her relationship with my father was a pattern. And so she, she talked about it and she wanted us to, um, have an outlet and to choose something different. Um, I think it was really hard to come to the Pueblo and feel like I belonged being that I'm part black. Um, I was teased a lot and um, yeah, and not really accepted by all the people here, you know, at first. Um, but I think kids can do those things, right? Like there's always something to be bullied about or to, 
now I feel like our younger generation is um, more acceptance. Like there's more acceptance and there's, they love each other. They just accept who each other, you know, who you are and where you come from and recognize you as like part of their community. I think that like on the end of my mom, like just who she was and how she walked her path and how she created space for healing for us and all my life. Like she, I think my mom was a medicine woman. She worked with the oils. She worked with the plants. Um, she was easy to talk to. People like just came to her. Um, she did lots of energy work and I watched her, right? And I, and it resonated with me. And I started doing some with her and asking her more questions and learning about the oils. And I just kind of followed in those steps. Um, and I think on the other end, like having a child and watching how they're navigating and, and moving through things and all the lessons that our young people bring us, right? Like on how serious my daughter tells me, mom, you're just too serious all the time. Or you just need to chill out or you just need to relax. And she's right, like she's right. Those are, those are healing messages. So I feel like um, I've just done so much like searching for healing and, you know, mostly about self-love, just learning to love myself and accept myself for who I am and, um, and also accept all the parts, the parts, you know, that aren't shiny, the parts that are, you know, that need fine tuning or the, the parts that only your intimate family get to know and loving all of, all of who I am. And um, like five years ago, I got to take a class with Dr. Ruby Gibson and learn about somatic archaeology um, it's generational healing, lineage healing. And I feel like that was the deepest work that I've ever done that I started to, to realize that I had never fully accepted the part of me that was black. Mm. You know, I had never really embraced that in a positive way. And maybe it's because society, the way that I had seen black people portrayed, maybe it was because of my dad and who he was, but for the first time, I was like, this is who I am. And with it comes beauty. And there's a lineage of strength and, and power and joy and, and it should be celebrated, you know? So I feel like, I feel like that was huge healing for me. And I feel like every day, right? Every day I'm still healing. Every day there's still work to be done. As long as I'm here walking on this earth, there's still healing to be done in myself. Beautiful, Taz. So how has your indigeneity and your being of Black African heritage affected or influenced your healing process, journey, and medicine? Is there some way they correlate? Because obviously, they're both very, very powerful cultures that you come from. I mean, oh my God, you know, it's just like, wow, super, super powerful like is there do you feel like something in the genetics mixing the pueblo and the Af it's just amazing that you have those two blends to me i'm just like wow yeah dr ruby um used to say that the mixed blood are the ones that um a lot of times hold the medicine in the family you know in the families in the lineage um she would say because they take those two parts of um where there's conflict and they bring them together and they're resolving and healing those issues that those two um, ethnicities might have. And so I think that when I came to the Pueblo, what I loved was I loved dancing. I loved praying. I loved praying in this way. I loved going to the Kiva. I loved being on the plaza. It felt familiar to me and it felt welcoming and and in the Kiva, I never felt bullied. I felt like I belonged there, that that was the place for me. Um, I think that it's, like I said, it's just recent that I've started to embrace like my gifts of being black. Mm -hmm. But I also look at both cultures and recognize the huge amount of um, colonization and oppression among those two groups, those two ethnicities 
and also the strengths and the warriorism and the power and the to survive and to thrive and I'm proud to be both you know I'm I'm proud to walk in this body that I've been given and I'm proud to do the work for my community working with both black and indigenous people well I don't want to say anything out of context but I consider you to be a very powerful healing person and the vehicle that you present that you encapsulate in your body gives me this feeling like I can trust I can mm-hmm. trust the process because I can trust you even without even knowing you it's just a feeling that I get from people and I think you have that so do you mm-hmm. feel like Thank because you. I because you're such a powerful healer even though you're you know, in the Indian world, we're not supposed to say that, but um, um, did you have to heal yourself before you could become that? Did you have to do like a lot of work on yourself before you, before you could be that for other people so they could experience their own medicine? Um, I think that we all have gifts of teaching and healing that we give to one another, whether we intentionally do it or not. Um, I think when we decide to walk in the steps to facilitate healing, then yes, there's work that you begin to do on yourself, that when you take those steps, then things are shown to you um, that you can't deny anymore, that you have to clear, that you have to change your lifestyle. Um, I think that when I was younger, I used to drink so much alcohol and um, be around and just party and have a good time. And I wasn't an alcoholic, um, but at times I feel like I overdrink, that I drink too much. And as I started walking this path, I recognized that I can't do that work and drink like that. You know, the two, the two of them just don't work together. And part of being a healer is how we care for the vessel that we're in, right? Um, so that's a tricky question because I also feel like I'm always healing. There's still stuff I can look at myself and recognize that, um, there's patterns in me that I'm still working to change and shift and move. And yet, do I feel like I can sit with someone and hold space and facilitate with them their healing process? Yes, I think that the trick is to know that we are, we are healing ourselves and we are walking in this way and also we can still help others to heal, you know? I love the fact that people go and learn and get educated and read, 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 read. I think reading is so good because it develops serious critical thinking. But on the same token, I also think that the school of hard knocks is even more, um, how do I say, more valuable uh, because to be able to understand where your clients are coming from, particularly in a Native American context, and have been able to say, you know, I've, I've had one drink too many myself and have that kind of compassionate empathy on top of the training and the book smart stuff. I think that's a nice way. So I think qualifiers might be really an asset to really be effective, not just super academic, you know? Yeah. And also too, what you're saying is like to understand like our communities, right? To understand like, um, how alcohol and substances have played a part in in our lives and in our communities and also to to understand how racism has played a a part in our lives and how boarding schools and and also to understand the strengths of our dancing and how our culture has played such a huge um, part in our life right the our prayers and our ancestors having those strengths and those gifts i always like to say when I hear people talk about generational trauma for a long time, I heard about generational trauma and that starts to weigh on you. If that's all you're hearing is wow, you're carrying all this generational trauma. Mm. But what you forget is we're also carrying this generational warriorism, this generational strength, this generational joy, this generational like prayers and dancing and love and laughter. And we can't forget like that we are, that power and that strength that we are moving forward with too. And the ability to heal ourselves in this day and also to heal for our our past generations, to to heal for our ancestors. 
Yes, absolutely. So can you talk a little about, little about you mentioned uh, somatic archaeology. That sounds really intense. Uh, can you tell me a little bit more about that? Yeah, so um, somatic archaeology is a process where I sit with someone um, and I walk with them through their body. So a lot of times when we experience trauma or we experience something hard, our brain will, will shut it down so that we don't have to remember all the pieces of it, but our body remembers. And our body and epigenetics has proved that our body also holds genetic memory. So if we hold genetic memory, it means that we have access to some things that our mothers experienced and our grandmothers experienced and our great grandmothers experienced and so on and so on and so on. So somatic archeology span is finding places in your body that are calling to you or where trauma lives or where there's a message stored that needs to be erupted so that it can move out your system so it can be healed for you and for your future generations and for the past, for your past lineage. It's really powerful. It's, it's an amazing, it's an amazing um, modality that I'm so grateful to hold right now. Um, I have seen people who have had a certain weird health issue that they've been battling with for years and going to doctors and getting treatment and then sit with them and only to like have it stir up that there's this emotional and there's this um, lineage and this pattern in their family where it's where it started and be able to give it what it needs to release it and then it's gone wow that's amazing it's, it's amazing it's amazing work it's good work well great and what's different about that healing compared to others um, for me as a facilitator of healing, what, what I love about it is that, um, I don't have to, t I don't take it on. I, when someone's going through that process, you know, I'm, I'm not picking it up. Um, what I love for the, for in receiving that healing is that you do one, one or two sessions of the somatic work can, can clear something that could take you years through other kinds of therapy you go you dive in really really deep and it's hard it's the, there's nothing easy about it it's going to be the hardest you're going to be in the 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 muck of it you're gonna you know it's grungy it's ugly and it's painful but then you in the whole process you go that to that place where it's that dark and that painful and you move out of it and you actually get to heal it in that moment. Mm. And immediately afterwards, you feel lighter. You feel lighter, you feel better. You feel like you release something. So you actually, instead of like sometimes when I've gone to, to talk therapy and I'm not discounting talk therapy, I still have a talk therapist and I appreciate her so much. But when you go to talk therapy, sometimes you talk about something, you stir it up and then you leave there and it's a little bit like in your mind and in your head and it's still like you're still like concentrated on it. In somatic work, you go in, it's really hard and intense. You get to resource it and re resolve it, give it what it needs. And then you feel better. You leave actually feeling lighter and feeling better, even though you went so deep and so hard it does take time to integrate and it sometimes feels tender you sometimes feel tender afterwards you know which Interesting. Mm -hmm, yeah I love, what, <laughs> I love what you said when you said you give it what it needs the it comes to mind so it's a living entity spirit inside that needs freedom yes wow yes. that's deep so yes. is well Oh, I got one question I want to ask you. How did you learn about this? Um, so actually I had had a really, really hard year. Um, and I just was praying about like, how do I move through all of this? There's so much that I'm still working on and I, I need, I need something. <laughs> and a friend of mine um, sent me this link that said, 
Um, Dr. Ruby Gibson from Freedom Lodge is teaching her somatic archaeology course and um, is accepting applications for um, and it's and it's free to any um, indigenous um, community healers, social workers, therapists. Um, and the application was due the very next day. So I got it and the application was due. And it was like an extensive application because it's a, um, a master's program. And so I was like, well, that sounds great, but forget it. There's no way I'm gonna, I'm gonna get my application in by the next day. So the next day I called and it was just on my mind all night long. I was thinking about it, thinking about it. And the next day I called and they said, just get your application and just take what time it needs to and just get it in that we're gonna extend it for a couple of weeks. So just get your application in. And so I sent it in and then it worked out for me that it was offered at Ghost Ranch because as a single mom, like traveling back and forth would have been hard, but it was at Ghost Ranch. So I was able to do it with my daughter. Like, wow. That and then go such... to South Dakota too. Then I was able to go to South Dakota. That is one state I want to go to. I've been invited several times. I just need to make it happen. So that's on my bucket list for sure. Yeah. So is there um, an exercise we, we can all do together, all of us on all the social media platforms and on the Zoom screen to help ourselves in trauma? Just like a little sample or something you can well, share with us? Sure. Um, the biggest thing is, um, so if everyone wants to do it now, I mean, is, is our breath. So first of all, when, when trauma happens, when, when we experience something hard, um, we st if we can stop, just stop a minute and just take a deep breath. Breathing in through our nose and out through our mouth. And just allow us time. It's like when an animal is hit by a car or has experienced some traumatic um, situation, they often lay down there. They just lay down, they stay down. And then when they've integrated what has happened to them, then they get up and they shake and they move and they move it all around. So one of the things that <clears throat> I'm, I love and I'm a huge believer in and practice it um, almost daily is scanning your body. So closing your eyes softly and I'll do this with you guys. And then taking a deep breath in through your nose and out through your mouth. And just allowing your breath to move from your feet all the way up your body. I like to do one side first and then the other side, but you can do it all together and just allow your breath to move up and down your body and notice what you feel. Notice if there's sensations in your body, if there's tension, notice if there's places that are cooler or hotter Notice places that you can't even get a sense of, that they feel far away. Notice the parts of you feel heavy. And notice when you bring your breath through your body, if there's places that it feels like your breath gets stuck. And then once you notice those places, allow your breath to concentrate in that one area. So if it was your stomach, imagine that your stomach had its own mouth and you could breathe into your stomach and out from your stomach and then ask your stomach, what does it need? And then be patient and listen. Maybe it's to slow down. Maybe it's the breath in of itself to breathe deeper into all the parts of our body. And just allow your breath to swirl around your stomach, moving all around the area or whichever area in your body it is. And 
And just notice if it starts to loosen, if it starts to let go, if it starts to tell a story, if you notice if you something pops into your mind or a person pops into your mind or a certain time popped into your mind or if you sense something or if you notice that part of your body and you start to get mad or angry, feel anger, or you start to get sad, then allow your body to have that. Allow your body to feel that. And then when you feel like you've shifted it some, Go back to breathing completely from your feet all the way to your head and back down. Always remember to thank your body for speaking to you, for the work it does, for sustaining you. And then when you open your eyes and come back present, do it slowly, integrate, integrate slowly back into the here and now. So that's a little, hey, like a beginning, a little taste. You know. I hear that. Thank you very much. Um, I got tears in my eyes and I love the fact that you gave me permission to be mad. I've never heard that before. It's always like, don't be mad, don't be mad. It's like, mm -hmm. wow, well, there is some anger stored up in there somewhere. So thank you. I'll practice some more of those breathing exercises. And uh, so finally, Taz, our theme, as you know, is thriving in purpose. What is your definition of thriving in purpose now, considering since last April to now, what's happened to our selves, to our communities, to our families, to our nation, and to our world? Where are you at with all this thriving in purpose? Yeah. Um, wow, that's a good question. Um, I think, yeah, it's given us... Um, a lot to reimagine, right? And to and to realize that we are here to care for one another, that we are here to look after one another, that we are each other's responsibility, you know, and that all these losses of these souls moving on that it affects all of us, that we're vibrational people. Um, and all the mourning that people are doing for their loved ones loss, that we are all carrying part of that and that we need to carry part of that so that our brothers and sisters who are grieving the loss of their loved ones can stay strong enough to care for themselves. I think the other part is that um, Thriving in purpose is taking good care of ourselves, taking good care of our, our bodies as well, eating good foods, moving, um, sitting still, meditating, um, exercising, you know, all the things. Like it's, it's about loving ourselves truly, deeply, and not having to be perfect, like just loving ourselves just the way we are and tending to ourselves in a good way so that we can be healthy to go out and, and do our work, to, to live our magic and to live our purpose. Um, I think now more than ever, there are people who need us to be strong, who need to have you know, um, facilitators of healing to lean on or to call upon. And I think it also is reimagining the way that we do the work, right? I mean, I did this work, somatic work is a very one-on-one -on -one in person. So 
getting comfortable and starting to look and listen intuitively in a different way while watching someone on a screen, right? But to find ways to still do our work, find ways to still, like you guys, you, you and Elena, you had to reimagine how do we, how do we touch everyone? How do we reach out? How do we stay connected? Right. And you always found a beautiful way to, to, to help people who are lonely or who are by themselves or it's just, we've got to be creative and we still have to find ways to care for one another while taking care of ourselves. Beautiful. I just came up with this beautiful idea when I asked you that question, fun work in progress. (laughs) So thank you so much, Taz. That's so awesome. My heart is filled and I hope everybody else is this evening. So I just want to do a quick uh, announcement. We have our concert series this coming Saturday at three o'clock Mountain Standard Time. We have Gina Breedlove. She focuses in sound healing and she is a beautiful singer, performer, and her qualifications for music and performing are just too far, too many to announce. So be sure three o'clock Saturday, if you got nothing going on, click on our link, go to Indigenous Ways. Remember, it's Mountain Standard Time, three o'clock. So if you're in California, it's two o'clock. If you're in uh, Wisconsin, it's four o'clock. And if you're in New York, it's five o'clock. Anyways, that's silly. Um, So our (laughs) Indigenous Ways uh, website has all the information you need. You can find us on our website. different social media sites uh indigenous ways up here down below is all the social media sites elena has found us to join and of course uh we have uh, more information about all of our presenters we have a beautiful video archive that people can use academically curriculums in classes in schools in programs it's uh oral storytelling and um so definitely check it all out. We've had over 70 presenters since we've started hosting this platform. And we'd love for you to share this recorded video with everyone you know, which will be available in the next 48 hours. And it will be permanently archived in our collection. And while you're at our website, please subscribe to indigenousways.org's weekly newsletter. So we'll be putting one out tomorrow on this evening's event. And below me, you'll see all of our social media pages. Please like and subscribe to them, especially if you are currently viewing from them uh, now. That really helps us. Thank you. All of our virtual events have ASL interpreters and are free. And because of that, we'd like to thank our sponsors, Native American Advised Fund, Santa Fe Community Foundation, Westaf, New Mexico Arts, and aside from that, we want to thank all of our Indigenous Ways board members and individual donors. And we have our Navajo Nation Deaf and Hard of Hearing uh, addition to our seven consecutive relief runs to Black Mountain. We saw a need and we were shocked to find out that 95% uh, thereabout of the uh, Navajos and deaf and hard of hearing indigenous folks have been missing out on these relief um, drop-offs from the tribal members to chapter houses. And we found this out and we said, you know what, we got this platform and let's, let's, let's add the, uh, some community members that are stuck out in the reservation, beautiful lands that are without communication. So we've been able to uh, get some beautiful liaisons, Navajo deaf on the reservation. And we have our presenter last week, Eve Wiggins, who wants to be a supporter and um, support our movements with the Navajo and all indigenous staff on reservations. So she wants to get involved as well. So that's really beautiful. So this is all new and uh, there's plenty of information. You can uh, get ready and help us get ready for our March 18th and 19th relief run to deliver supplies to uh, 40 deaf natives in the McKinley County and surrounding areas. This is specifically for folks who have missed out and who are struggling 
And we would also, we're also planning on going up to Black Mountain. We're collaborating with Indigenous Ways and Indigenous Ways has connect us, connected us with another organization called Colorado Compassion. So there's gonna be three organizations going on this run. It's gonna be a two or three day run, big trucks, U-Hauls, the whole convoy thing. It's gonna be fun, <coughs> pardon me. If you're able, please give to and donate at our website. And you can also send checks if you'd like. And uh, everybody come on in. Let's say hi to Taz. Um, Janie Immerman says it's almost like you're in a cocoon and they, and you blossom into a butterfly. <laughs> it's in your DNA, it's in our DNA, but how do we unlock it? Uh, this is our sister from New York City. How does it different from Reiki? And how do we connect with you for healings? This is for you, Taz. This is to Janie in New York. Um, thank you, Janie. Yeah, um, the cocoon and you are all that magic even, even before you turn into the butterfly. You are magic the whole way through. So I just want to say that first. Um, yeah, I mean, I'm available. I do online work now. So, so I'm available um, to, to do the work online. Um, it's really different than Reiki because Reiki is um, light force energy being sent into you, which is more peaceful than this work. This work is is not is not peaceful. If there's anger in you, if there's um, in your body, or if there's grief in your body that's been stored there and there for years, or if your parents didn't cry, or if your grandparents couldn't speak what was happening to them are, and you give sound to it and you give voice to it, it's going to be loud and it's going to be big and it's going to be full. And um, you want it to be, that's okay. Um, but yeah, it's really different than Reiki, but it ends in this way that you resource yourself afterwards that you can give yourself what you need to also tend and care for that freshly discovered spot in your body or that place in your body. It's not like you just leave it open and raw, something was removed and then it's just empty and, and raw there. You resource it and you give it something to tend to it and care for it as it's integrating, as you're integrating the shift and change. Yeah, and your body starts to, it's amazing. Your body starts to recognize the work. Like, um, so I was working with this woman and I always do four sessions. And so um, by the time I came on the third time, her body was already starting to have all the reactions to be like, here, this is what we're gonna work on today. Like your, your body is ready for it and starts to, and will call in the places where you're ready to heal. And I don't think your body calls in things that you're not ready to move or that you can't move. You know, I think that, um, yeah, I think that your body knows. And, and when you, you work in this beautiful, um, harmonious way with your body, heart, mind, spirit, and soul. Beautiful. And mm -hmm. Thank you so much for that question, Janie. And we have in the chat box from Dusty. Uh, will your contact info be in our newsletter email archive or can I add it to the newsletter tomorrow so that people can access you, Taz? Sure. Yeah, you can add my email and um, that'd be great. And my Facebook page too. I'm working on a website, but it's not done yet. <laughs> we will definitely do that, Taz. And then also another question from Suzanne Kohler says, is it Dr. Ruby Gibson who does the somatic archeology? span Question for Taz. Yeah, so Dr. Ruby Gibson's my teacher and she's the one who, um, who created with the help of her ancestors. She has this really beautiful story on how the teachings came to her, but she's the one who's teaching people now. She has an organization, it's called Freedom Lodge and so you can Google it or look it up that way. She's still training more um, practitioners and it's her dream and her goal that this becomes so prevalent that it's in the schools and in the um, judicial system and wow. 
that it's something that we can offer all people with struggling with addiction, um, with domestic violence, so that we can heal the deepest places in us so that we're not still tied to these, these pains and these, these stories. Beautiful. Thank you very much, uh, Dusty and uh, Suzanne, for your questions. And I'm going to go ahead and open it up to the Zoom screen. Uh, but before we disconnect tonight, I want us to sing happy birthday to our friend Arletta from Luca Chukai. And we can follow our interpreter s signing it for her. But let's wait. Let's get you guys uh, asking your questions first. And then we'll do a birthday song for our beautiful friend Arletta from Luca Chukai. Wait, miss, hold on. <laughs> okay, questions. Should I ask um, who wants to talk? Christina Bueno, you always have something to say. Would you like to share? CB on the chess from New York. Did you want to say anything, Christina Bueno? Oh, she's having a hard time locating where the interpreter is. Oh, Chris, we can't hear you. The interpreter is off to the side, and I didn't really see what you said. I'm sorry. Do you mind repeating that? By the time I saw that you were speaking to me, I found the interpreter. Okay, this, but, uh, is, me. this is me, Tasha's voice. Christina Bueno, you always have beautiful things to say. Would you like to share something? Go for it. Related, yes, about related. the presentation today? Yes. In that case, yes, Tosh. I must say I was very drawn in to the somatic archaeology and the stories that are embodied within us and understanding how they're generational and they're carried within us. And those stories, even though they were lived by our ancestors, they're in our DNA still. And I found that extremely fascinating and I was thinking about it just the other day, I was talking to myself and I was thinking, okay, well, I'm here now. My mom's passed away, uh, not recently, a couple of years ago, but I was thinking about my mom and I was thinking about her past and her struggles because growing up, I saw that my mom had struggles in her life. You know, we all do. Everyone has struggles in our life, including myself. We all have struggles that we face and deal with, which means that we all have this sense, this somatic sense. And so I found it so interesting to learn from the presentation today. And I'm very grateful for Taz, you sharing that with us today. I, I'm going to have to go back and listen to it again. Thank you. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you, Christina Bueno. We love you. All right, Denise Renee Lopez, would you like to share any words tonight? Uh, oh my gosh, I guess this must have been the perfect day for me to finally join in. I haven't joined for quite a while, even though I've come a few times, uh, but I love what you have to offer and I totally want to get all that ugly stuff out of me that you were talking about. So I'm looking forward to contacting with you. Uh, and, you know, we all we all want to feel lighter, especially in this pandemic. And anybody, <laughs> <laughs> and some of the ugly stuff did come out and I didn't know where to put it. And so I'm thinking, oh, this is, I was meant to be here today. That's all I have to say. Yeah, and I look forward to more communication with you you you're awesome thank you thank you thank you so much denise it's good to see you thanks for being here and sorry about that taz go ahead i'm sorry and i just want to say like if stuff came up for you just use your breath just move it into the air just move it in tell your body if you're going to do work with me then tell your body we'll contact her and and your body will hear you and understand but just move what's up move it out let it go release it yeah, and I I go uh, I have spoken to 
I forget the term you use, talking people or talking whatever. I've done that, but mm-hmm. I'm more of an intuitive type of person and I don't really like to go to the doctors for all this stuff that whatever they're going to give you medication and I don't really like medication because you're to me it feels like you're masking whatever it is you're trying to let out and so I rather feel whatever it is so that I know it's gone I don't know I've just always been that I don't know if that makes sense to you but I've never liked to be on medication for anything unless it's like total pain and I just need to cover that pain for a minute but to be on something constant consistently no I I tend to shy away from that kind of medication I guess you would call that the western medication I don't know yeah yeah Yeah. but thank you thank you thank you thank you (laughs) all right thank you very much Denise it's really good to see you back here with us and uh, does anybody right off the top have a burning desire to share something Hi, um, Michelle uh, here, so t- also known as Missy. So Taz, I just really enjoyed what you had to share with us, uh, with us on, on the, the somatic healing and uh, the generational trauma and also sharing about um, the cultural, you know, the cultural challenges that you faced growing up, which I experienced too, because I, I grew up on the Navajo Nation and um, I'm, I'm Navajo, but I'm also half white. And so I found myself always sometimes feeling like I was, I was singled out for that. And, you know, we come from a different generation and like my daughter is even lighter than me. And I took her back home after she was born and she really didn't get m- much of that at all, if anything, you know, cause I mean, it's, it's very different times. People are way more accepting of intercultural relationships and the children that come from that so that's what's really beautiful about that but growing up with that it did um, leave me growing up with a lot of insecurity even going living on the reservation with with the proving that I'm, I'm Navajo enough and then getting off the reservation and worried that I would be discriminated against or my native side and uh, so you know so it just kind of went both ways and and then um but I like the way you talk about how, you know, we can look at all the trauma that we experienced and all the bad things that has, it has brought up in us and, you know, the anger, the fear, the, you know, just, uh, you know, just being just all these other emotions that make you feel like a victim, but then to take it on the other standpoint that, you know, but I've got all these other things, all these strengths that I can draw from and, uh, and how do I use these strengths and make that the part of my life that I focus on and not the part of the, that I've had to overcome, but the strength in me that, that enabled me to be able to overcome those things and become the person I am today. So, so I like that. And I love the inner healing. I love the breathing exercises he gave to us. And I know that's just the healing breath. It's so important because mm-hmm. I yeah. start to notice a lot of times when I was upset, I would hold my breath, mm-hmm. you know, and I wasn't ever conscious of that, but I, as I started to become conscious of that and, and allow myself to breathe, I realized that I wouldn't be so anxious anymore. And, uh, but my body was just doing this fight or flight and it was just like trying to shut down and protect itself, which uh, was just actually causing me more anxiety. So, so yeah, thank you for sharing all of that. I really enjoyed your presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Michelle. Yeah. And our breath, what a tool. Like I I try to remind myself at least once throughout the day, just to notice how I'm breathing, just to notice if I'm breathing shallow or if I want to adjust it and breathe deeper. Right. So our breath is such a tool, but thank you, Michelle, for sharing that. And yes, you have all those generational warriorisms too. Thank you, Missy. Real quickly, I just want to acknowledge Susan Kohler, who says, so beautiful. Thank you. This is exactly what I've been looking for. I'm a regular archaeologist researching the Native part of my family, and that history is so covered up by trauma and denial in my living family members. I don't know how else to go about it. 
And then next, Mary Sue Adler Gilbert says, thank you, Taz, allowing me to know how to possibly release the trauma my body experienced in the past. And then next, I want to say one last shout out. Does somebody want to say something to Taz before we sing? All right, go for it, Christina Bueno. After Michelle spoke, <clears throat> Michelle, you just mentioned those people, or in the past, people considering you a half-breed. And I remember that uh, that's happened to me in the past as well, uh, being considered a, a half-breed. And how it's such different times. Nowadays, mixed people, no one really makes an issue of it anymore. But Michelle, just like you, I faced a lot of discrimination for being mixed and a lot of oppression. And then I would get upset and I would blame my parents. I would say, why did you have to mix and make me a half person? And I remember those feelings from before. And, and this is teaching me that, yes, yes, I have to be proud of both cultures. I have to be proud of my heritage. And not only that, also accept both my heritage and teach about those and, and teach each half of my family about the other half so that they can have an awareness, right? The white side of my family and the Mexican side of my family. So I, I've done that because my father is Mexican. And so I've taught my family about him. And then I've taught my Spanish family about my mom. She was white. I've done that cross-cultural sharing. And, and now I notice there's just so much more acceptance than even I accept myself. And I realize that uh, I have both cultures and, and I run on both sides. And so I agree exactly, Michelle, when you started saying that, I realized that was so true. I have faced a lot of those similar challenges. And I just wanted to share that real quickly. Thank you. Thank you so much, Thank Christina. You. That's beautiful. All right. Well, everybody, tonight's a very special night. Our beautiful sister, Arletta Tolan, has turned 67 years old today. She's in Lukachukai on the reservation, and she is very, very special to me. I consider her to be one of my very best friends. She taught me sign language in the early 80s. And Arletta is awesome. So everybody, I'm going to tell everybody that doesn't know sign language, we're going to sing simultaneously with copying the interpreter, our beautiful interpreter, Chris. So we're all going to sign happy birthday. And this is Arletta's sign name. You can also copy Zoel, our other ASL interpreter. This is Arletta, same sign as Arizona. So let's go ahead and get started. Okay, Arletta, this is for you. Everybody, happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Arletta. Happy birthday to you, and we love you, and many more to come. Ooh. Blessings to your turtles. You. Arletta has two turtles, everybody. Says, love you. All right, you guys, we are almost at the top of the hour. We love you, Arletta. Thank you, all who Thank joined us in Zoom, Arleta. all in social media, all watching in this recording in the future as you will and as always to all of our beautiful our beautiful not all of them but we have zoll and Cress, our asl interpreters thank you very much we love you very much and most of all let's give it up for taz power woman thank you thank you, thank you. touch the earth touch the earth touch the earth